right? So let's continue then. All right, so we, we have the reign of terror. We have um, all these people uh, getting killed for no real reason. Everyone's scared to death. And um, then finally, um, people say enough's enough. And uh, Robespierre himself ends up getting killed for supposedly being against the French Revolution. Then the whole thing kind of calmed down. Uh, what happens a lot in history, history goes in one direction, and um, then the next generation reacts to it and goes often to the extreme opposite direction. So, you know, think of um, many times in American history, for example, the 1960s, uh, early 60s, very state age, very conservative, and then what did you have at the end of the 60s? It went all the way in the other direction. Youth culture, uh, the gay movement, uh, the um, uh, drug culture, um, and uh, the, uh, the women's movement all kind of uh, all coexisting in that year, 1967 and 68 the protest songs, the anti-Vietnam rhetoric, and then, you know, people just said, enough's enough. So that's what kind of happens, but the majority of people are not particularly happy on either the far left or the far right. Or, or, or the far right. Most people kind of in the center, either going a little more towards the right or a little more towards the left. So that's kind of what we're gonna see here with uh, French history. Uh, so we, um, we saw all that extreme, fast-moving action with the reign of terror, and then what we're going to have the next period in French history is called the number one here, the Directory. The directory lasts 1795 to 1799. Instead of uh, one leader, uh, we now have three. So each of these uh, leaders referred to as a director, uh, hence the name, the Directory. 1795 to 1799. Uh, now, um, why do you think they would choose three leaders? And what, what, they wouldn't see the advantage of uh, having a system set up that way. Yeah. Whatever it's one person is coming with the king, so they can't really all look to one person. Right, it, 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 it gives them too much power. They, 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 they had enough of that. They, they had it under uh, the absolute monarchy over those years. Good. All right, but why, why, why three? Why, why not two? Yeah. The three different bosses. Okay, no, that, that, that's actually a really good thought. Um, but, but could actually be part of it. Uh, any, any other reason? We it's an for? uneven number. Right, not even number. What's, what's the advantage of having an odd number? Okay, right. That way you can't have a stalemate. It'll always be two to one. Either they'll agree or it'll be two to one. Uh, but um, now, after this very tumultuous activity with the Jacobins, remember everyone's scared to death. They're going to be the next one, uh, you know, picked off the street and uh, just accused of being against the revolution. See, the big difference between the French system and our system is our system is the presumption of innocence. You're presumed to be innocent until someone can prove that you're not innocent. The French system at the time, the exact opposite. You were guilty, and it was your duty to prove that you were innocent. But what if you couldn't prove that you were innocent? Then we saw what happened. So under the directory, it becomes a very staid uh, period. It's almost the calm after the storm. So one thing that does stand out about the directory uh, is um, the rise of what's called the number two here, the Gilded Youth. All right, so what, what does um, this spelling of uh, Gilded mean when it's spelled with an I instead of a U? Anyone know? Right, good. Covered something shiny, so usually covered in gold. Great. Um, now, the Gilded Youth, what it meant were young people who um, uh, basically um, uh, were longing for the king. 
So they wanted to be kings. They longed for the time of the kings. They hated the time of the um, uh, the Jacobins. They hated all the stuff with the revolution. So they longed for the stability of the kings. And they really took it to an excessive extent. They started dressing up as uh, wearing middle class kids wearing royal robes and silk stockings and calling each other uh, your lordship. Um, because they were longing for this time that they had not been part of. So, okay, so it would be like this. All right, what, what presidents do you really remember? Trump, Obama, Biden, right? You don't, you don't remember anything before that. All right, so let's say you say um, Biden, you know, not terrible, not great, call him Sleepy Joe, you know, just a kind of dull period uh, where things just seem to get, you know, inflation, nothing going amazingly well. I don't think anyone feels things are fantastic now. But um, then you had Trump, okay, very polarizing individual. We either usually love him or you can't stand him. So let's say you didn't really adore him, but you didn't um, hate him either. And uh, then you think of Obama, okay, a lot of excitement when he first came, particularly in the first uh, uh, time in office. Um, uh, talking a lot about hope and change, and you know, he looked different than any other president. The first uh, African American man is uh, president, so a lot of excitement that things were changing. But then you see the second time in office, and once again, not much got done, and nothing seemed to be getting any better. So let's say you long for a president of the past. You know, oh my God, if only we could be in the time of Jimmy Carter. Well. Do you remember what the time of Jimmy Carter was like? No, it was before uh, uh, your time. So, uh, you, you know, you remember, wait, it's, it's this really old guy, he seems like a really nice guy, he's done a lot for poor people with the uh, 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 house, house uh, for humanity, yeah. So it's kind of like people around the say, like, oh, I want to be alive in the 50s, I like to be alive in the 50s, but then they forget all the stuff that came with it. Like, right. So Perfect, yes, that's an even better example. Yeah, no, definitely. So, you know, a lot of cool cars and uh, not the crime that we have today. Every, you know, but then they're not thinking, wait a minute, look at all the lack of freedoms you had and if you're not of a certain group, you know, forget it. Yeah, very, very good example. So that, that's what they had here, this like, longing for the past without remembering or knowing what the life was like under the king. So that's when we have the rise of these gilded youth. <coughs> now the whole thing very stable, but kind of boring. And uh, then we have in 1899 an overthrow of the government, the coup, uh, short for coup d'état, a, a blow at the state, an overthrow of the government, and uh, that was started by uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, eventually known as. Napoleon the first. All right, now uh, Napoleon, um, now remember uh, the first day we talked about in that theory of um, history that uh, societies reach their golden age and then they never stay there forever, they eventually decline, at least according to the theory. Well, for many of the French, the Napoleonic age was seen as their golden age. So. Napoleon um, basically changing almost everything that France uh, stood for. It was a washed up country. It had never really recovered from the, uh, the fall of the monarchy. It was unstable. It was um, you know, just rapidly changing and then nothing really seeming to get better. Well, Napoleon's gonna change everything. He's gonna make, change France from being a kingdom to being a, a washed out kingdom to being an empire. What's the difference between a kingdom and an empire? Empires seek to take over as much as they can. Kingdoms kind of just run within themselves. Okay, 
yeah, uh, empire is much larger. They're taking over other areas, making it part of themselves. All right, so he's going to change France. France becomes the controlling place in Europe, the main place to be in Europe during the Napoleonic Age from roughly 1799 to 1814. So uh, often the, uh, the Napoleonic Age or France's golden age. Now, okay, what are some things we think of with Napoleon? What sort of comes to mind?
and not even blocked. Okay, so he automatically thought the French did everything the best. He took it for granted the French culture is the best culture there is, and he felt as he's taking over all these other countries, he's doing them a big favor. He's making them part of the glorious French empire. He's exposing them to French culture, French holidays, the French language, French food. He just took it for granted that it is the best. And you know, I'm going to be the first to admit I, I like a lot of things French. They're like a, I, I like art. I, I like uh, fine dining. I like rich food, particularly with a million tons of butter on it. Um, I like clothing, uh, particularly elaborate, dramatic, and expensive clothing. And um, uh, I, I also like language. So they're very precise on language. They care about the beauty of language. So it's a culture I personally really like. Fun. But does everybody like everything French? For example, is a German going to say, hey, French stuff's really bad. Look, look, look how much more refined the food is. Uh, pigeon and aspic sauce, uh, really rich cheeses, and uh, escargot and more of that delicious butter. Uh, now, they're used to big, heavy, bulky sausages like we had in the dining hall. Uh, they, they like uh, seven grain, big, heavy, bulky breads. They like over fried uh, uh, cutlets. They like dark, heavy beers instead of, you know, uh, champagne or uh, cordials. So if someone likes that, are they going to like the French ways of doing things? No. Now, did Napoleon respect any other way of doing things? No. So as he takes over these other countries, he's going to force them to uh, follow French culture and believed that he was doing a big favor for them. Just as the Europeans, once they took over Africa, they felt the same thing. They felt, we're doing them a big favor. We're getting them into heaven while conveniently taking over all the African land. Okay, uh, so Napoleon, uh, what does he do? Well, the first thing uh, he's going to solve is the religious problem. So remember, they got rid of religion in France under the National Assembly. Does anyone remember what happened there? They took over the room, they took their land, they gave it to their friends, and uh, they said, what, what do we need these people? All they do is uh, suck up all the wealth of the country, they don't really produce anything. But notice even in, in our you know, modern society, religion is still a very important thing for a lot of people. Think of all the occasions that are in one way or another based on religion. Where, where do you see often these people that you don't see the rest of the year are somehow related to religious services? You see them at Easter, you see them at Christmas, you see them at weddings, you see them at baptism, bar mitzvahs, funerals. And then, you know, you see them then, oh, I wish we could see each other another time, and then you never do. Okay, so religion's a big part of uh, people's culture, and particularly back then. Now, the only religion that had basically in France at the time, or at least the dominant religion, was Roman Catholicism. But he got rid of that. Well, a lot of people missed it, and he is going to bring it back. Well, how is he going to do that after throwing out all of the priests and taking all of uh, the Pope's land? Is the Pope going to be really, real happy to bring it back? N yes and no. Because he did not like not having control of France. So Napoleon's going to make a deal with the Pope. He makes an agreement. Uh, Napoleon agrees that France is officially a um, Roman Catholic country, which it you know, really is. About 99% of the people at the time are Roman Catholic. So he, 
officially recognizes France as a uh, Catholic country, and he officially recognized the Pope as the head of the Roman Catholic Church in France. Okay? But he's going to also want something from the Pope in return. So he's going to get the Pope to declare that disobeying Napoleon is grounds for eternal damnation. Is that a big deal uh, or not really in the time period? 100%. What that meant, you don't do what Napoleon says, you're going straight to hell. The Pope says so. Would that work in our country today? What if uh, the Pope said disobeying President Biden is grounds for eternal damnation? Why, why wouldn't it work here? other than the fact that there are about a dozen other religions? Okay. Roman Catholicism is not the majority religion in the country. And even among Roman Catholics, uh, they even have a term for American uh, Catholics. They call them often buffet Catholics. They take the parts of the doctrine that they want and ignore the parts that are either too inconvenient or they just don't like. So it would be like going to Chinese buffet, grabbing all the crab legs and the shrimp and leaving the bok choy for somebody else. No offense to any bok choy lovers. Okay, so um, it, would, it wouldn't work. We're a secular society for the most part. People are not that super religious. There are many different religions. So how much would a Protestant uh, which who are the majority of the country, uh, how much are they going to care about uh, what the Pope says? Not at all. How much is a Jew? Not at all. A Wiccan? Not at all. An atheist, agnostic? Zero. So it wouldn't have the same meaning, but at a time when everyone is fairly religious and the only main religion in, in France is Roman Catholicism, that's a really big deal. Okay, so that's one thing he does. He brings religion back, and people feel that sense of comfort and meaning and happiness and community that they often get from religion. Okay, so they're going to like that. Now, another thing that he's constantly doing is saying the French things, of ways of doing everything are the best. Now, everyone kind of has that need to feel important, right? You want to feel that your ways of doing things are the best ways of doing things. He is feeding that, so that becomes very popular as well. Okay. Uh, now, uh, some other things he does. Okay, he is going to also create a law code, which he humbly names after himself. Uh, so he creates the Napoleonic um, law code, or as it's called, the number four here, the Code Napoleon. Code Napoleon gives the appearance of being very egalitarian. So giving everyone um, equal rights, equal opportunities, equal degrees of uh, respect and power. Because that's going to fit in very well with that ethos coming out of the um, French Revolution, remember? Uh, liberty, equality, <coughs> fraternity. So he seems to be speaking to that. But in reality, he favors certain groups over others, and that's evident there in the uh, Code Napoleon. So which groups does it uh, favor? It favors the French over the non-French. It favors the uh, rich over the poor. It favors the um, old over the young. It uh, favors men over women. So notice what, what groups are going to be in power. The traditional ones that have always been in power. But it gives that appearance of treating everyone equally. 
Well, how can you get away with that? Well, what about here? Does everyone have equal opportunities? Is um, a rich, uh, older, white guy in the suburbs going to be treated the same as a poor black uh, guy in um, the inner city? No. Okay, so he just keeps the traditional ones in power while giving this appearance of being very, you know, uh, egalitarian. Now, another thing that he's going to do um, is, now, to just to give you an example, under the uh, Code Napoleon, um, women are not allowed to inherit property. So, if a father wants to leave his daughter uh, his uh, property upon his death, he can't do it. He has to leave it to his son-in-law and trust for her. If she's not married, he will leave it uh, in trust with uh, the bank for her. Why? Because they see women as children. So just like you wouldn't give a, uh, you know, a, a five-year-old um, a large inheritance, uh, you're not going to, um, without someone watching over it, you're not going to leave it to uh, women. Women can't even pick their own spouse at the time. They have to have permission from their fathers. Their father's dead, they have to get permission from a male family member, like an uncle. So it's definitely favoring certain groups over others. Now, another thing that Napoleon does is he sets up what's called a uh, number five here, a meritocracy. Okay, a meritocracy, uh, where you really are going to see this is in terms of the military. Thing. Traditionally, the European armies were very class-bound. Uh, it was seen as a gentleman's army, an army led by gentlemen. So if you did not come from the right social background, you could not move up in the army and become an officer, <coughs> no matter how good you were at it. You wouldn't get that chance. Meanwhile, if you came from an affluent family, uh, your son would go in uh, as a captain, if not a major, even without any experience. It's like almost a little bit what we see today with the, uh, the military, with the ROTC. You know, they're going to go in as an officer because they went to college, whereas the enlisted guy, um, you know, the sergeant, been doing it for 20 years, isn't going to move up. Okay, so he does um, set up a meritocracy. So it gives poor people a chance to move up. He gets rid of a lot of gentlemanly traditions that were usually a big part of the military. So you're gonna see many younger people moving to positions of power in the Napoleonic army, which you never saw before. So he says, I don't care what class background you're from, I care how successful you are, how good a leader you are, how brave you are, uh, are you willing to take on risky missions, do you have innovative ideas that allow us to uh, conquer our enemies. This, and this encourages a lot of people that normally would not have even tried to be in the military because they knew they didn't come from the right social background. So. Napoleonic army uh, really, um, you know, did well. Now he does make some mistakes. Uh, one mistake he makes is going to be with Germany. He says, look, these Germans, they're really tough. You know, they wake up uh, going on military marches. This is seen as a form of entertainment for them. Uh, we're, we need a lot of uh, military power to conquer the Germans. So he sends in way more than he even needed. Okay, so he overestimates the Germans, but he underestimates the Spanish. He said the Spanish are kind of lazy. Uh, they don't seem very well organized. They uh, look at their uniforms. They're not very um, up to date. You know, they're, they don't know what they're doing. So he says, hey, we'll, we'll send in a lot of military uh, 
firepower, they'll just give up, we'll conquer them. He ignored Spanish nationalism, which has always been very strong. So it takes over um, three times as many men to conquer Spain as he uh, initially thought. The, uh, there's, an, there's an interesting portrayal of that in art by, uh, it's called The Fourth of May by Goya. Uh, romantic, romantic work. Okay, so um, he gets rid of all these gentlemanly traditions. So, for example, the idea, don't don't shoot at people uh, between four and five, that's when a gentleman has tea. So they put down their weapons. He says, hey, that's a perfect time to shoot at them. You can see those bright spoon teacups uh, from hundreds of uh, miles, well, not hundreds of miles away, but from hundreds of yards away, that's the perfect time to shoot them. And they're, you know, we can't do that. That's not ungentlemanly like. He said, who cares as long as we win? So he doesn't admire traditional gentlemanly class. He admires success. So he definitely changes their uh, military. All right. Well, one place where he really makes a big mistake is in attacking uh, Russia. Uh, he's going to make the same exact mistake that Hitler later makes. He decides to attack Russia in uh, winter, in 1812. Well, what, what's, what's Russia known for? What's like, the first thing you think about with Russia? Cold, yeah. You know, and are we, are we talking about, uh, you know, like a little cold or like, you know, uh, Siberian Ice Age cold? Yeah, so really, really cold. So they're used to it. Uh, so Russia's an agrarian society. It's cold. It's backwards. Russia's about 300 years behind the rest of Europe for most of its history. Uh, and... Um, uh, so he decides to attack Russia in um, winter, in 1812, and he sends in his troops with five days' worth of supplies. Now, as he conquers these other uh, countries, he's going to, of course, make them follow everything French. He honestly believed he's doing them a big favor. He's exposing them to the French culture and uh, giving them a better way of life. But is that how they're going to see it? No, they're going to see it as uh, invasive. And of course, arrogant. Okay, so he sends in this uh, troops with five days' worth of supplies. He said the Russians will see our military might and how organized we are and uh, how good we are at marching, and uh, they're going to just give up. The Russians don't do that. The Russians resort to what's called the um, Number six here, the scorched earth policy. So in the 1812, the uh, scorched earth policy is when they uh, they burn their own homes and their own uh, crops, so their own food supplies, and just keep retreating further east into Russia. Okay, but uh, now what is the French um, climate like? Are, are they used to extreme cold? No, it's, it's temperate. Uh, and do they seem like a culture that really deprives themselves a lot? Like, you know, really do without? No. So, um, he sends them in with five days worth of supplies, they quickly run out, there's nothing they can grab from the Russians, the shelter's gone, there's no crops to eat, and uh, many of them in, uh, try to get back uh, home uh, and die on the way. There's even this sign uh, on the way that uh, shows how many troops uh, went past there on the way into Russia and how many end up going back. It's less than half. So when the ones who get back, once they get back, are they likely to wait for Napoleon? How loyal are they really going to be to him to 
considering we force them into that situation and then also doesn't respect their cultures at all. Now, they're not going to stand around there. So when he finally gets back, he gets sentenced to um, into exile. Uh, he first gets sentenced to exile uh, at a place called St. Helena. St. Helena is off the coast of uh, Italy. And uh, he's in there in exile for um, two years. So he's there in St. Helena from 1812 to 1814. His whole time there, he's plotting what he's going to do once he gets out. Now remember, very proud man, very arrogant man, big chip on his shoulders despite small stature. And is he going to want to come back simply and easily? No, he wants to show that was a fluke with Russia. Now he's not going to attack them again, but this time he goes after Britain. So in 1814, he becomes involved at the uh, Battle of Waterloo. Uh, so Napoleon is there at the Battle of Waterloo commanding the, uh, the French troops. And uh, we have the Duke of Wellington commanding the British troops. It's going to be a massacre. Napoleon lost and lost badly to the um, Duke of Wellington at the Battle of Waterloo. They even use that term today. You call an ultimate defeat somebody's Waterloo. They actually have a similar term um, in the ancient world. There they call it a Carthaginian peace. Carthaginian peace is, uh, that happens after the three Punic Wars between Rome and the Carthaginian Empire in the ancient world. And once they lost completely to Rome, uh, ultimate defeat is called a Carthaginian peace in the ancient world. And in the modern period, they call it a Waterloo. So someone's downfall is their Waterloo. So if you don't come to class and just keep giving a bunch of excuses why you're not coming to class, uh, and then you just take the midterm, that will in all likelihood be your part of it. Okay, so then Napoleon does of course not die there at the Battle of Waterloo. He instead goes, is put in exile uh, at in um, Elba. Uh, Elba's uh, in South Africa. It's about 5,000 miles away from France. So we, you know, down there, uh, pretty south in, in, in Africa. And there he dies in uh, Elba, South Africa, uh, an island uh, in um, 1821. There actually was some talk about him coming to the United States. Uh, they were building a palace for him in the French Quarter of New Orleans. Somewhere around the old absinthe house, I believe. Now, his brother, uh, Joseph Bonaparte, actually does come to uh, America and brings a lot of French traditions uh, with him. So they become very popular with the upper class Americans of the time, particularly those in the southern United States. Okay, so any questions or comments about, um, oh yeah, so let's talk a little bit about how he dies. Well, there's di different theories about how he dies. Uh, one that's gotten a lot of credence is the uh, idea that um, 
he died from um, arsenic poisoning. That uh, he always used to take a lot of uh, hot baths, and they had you know beautiful wallpaper at the time. Or how did they, you know, keep it in place? Uh, glue and it was kind of arsenic based. So after a while, uh, the steam from his many hot baths uh, overcame it. So next time you take a hot bath, which I guess you can't hear at the school, but at home. Uh, but do they touch here or do they just little shower? Yeah, probably showers. Uh, uh, well, something to keep in mind. Okay, so any questions or comments? Yeah? What was the name of the person who said that? Uh, help. Anything else, anyone? All right, let's start talking about our. Uh, next unit, we're going to start talking about, remember I said the course is going to be talking about the three main revolutions that bring in the modern period of history. We have the French Revolution, the change in government and the rights of the people. Uh, then we have the Industrial Revolution, the Industrial Revolution focusing on the factory system, the change from handcrafted goods to uh, machine-made goods, and then the whole changing the whole society around it. And then uh, eventually we're going to get to the Romantic movement, which is a revolution in terms of uh, art, music, and literature. All right, let's start talking a little bit about the Industrial Revolution. Now, the Industrial Revolution uh, is going to make England the richest country in the history of the world. So a tremendous amount of wealth uh, coming to Britain because of the uh, Industrial Revolution. Uh, the Industrial Revolution is going to start about the same time as the French Revolution, starting about the 1780s and going all the way to the, um, about the 1840s. So 1780s to the 1840s. And uh, the Industrial Revolution, one way to look at it is it's kind of made up of uh, three uh, sub-revolutions. There's going to be the um, Agricultural Revolution. The Agricultural Revolution is a change in the um, ownership of the farms uh, from individually owned, uh, privately owned um, independent farms to commercial cash crop farms that focus on a particular farm good. And then the change from um, uh, individual farming to um, the use of many machines. So that's, um, I'm just kind of giving you an overview of these. We're gonna go into all of these in a lot of detail. Not, not, not today, but we will. Uh, we have the technological revolution. The technological revolution is looking at the technology, the inventions that made the industrial revolution possible. So what inventions came to England and how did that change English society? And the third sub-revolution of the industrial revolution is what's called the number 13 here, the commercial revolution. And commercial or commerce talks about the buying and selling of goods. So what the commercial revolution is about is the change in the um, relationship between the buyer and seller of goods from a direct relationship where the buyer and seller of goods knew each other and had a close relationship uh, to a uh, indirect relationship where there's a middleman who uh, comes between the buyer and seller of goods uh, so that the buyer and seller of goods no longer know each other uh, or care about each other. That the only thing that becomes important is how much money you make. Craftsmanship, quality of goods, meaning of your uh, uh, work, none of that means anything anymore with the Industrial Revolution. It changes to how much am I being paid and what do I have to do to uh, uh, keep my job? 
So it changes. Now, right on the eve of the Industrial Revolution, there's going to be a um, Scottish demographer, a population expert, by the name of uh, Thomas Robert Maltus. And uh, Maltus uh, wrote a book in the um, 1770s made up of um, a collection of essays. His collection of essays were called Essays on Population. And uh, in Essays on Population, he wrote one um, essay that uh, sent a lot of fear through many people's um, understanding of things. In um, what he shows is he looks at the numbers and he looks at how the English population between 1700 and 1770 tripled. So for every one person that was there in 1700, now there's three. So uh, huge population increase. And what he was worried about, uh, Maltus, was he says, hey, if this continues at this rate, there's not going to be enough food to feed people. There's not going to be enough fuel to heat people's homes. So the whole society will uh, disintegrate. So he, he, he was worried about that happening. Now notice the Industrial Revolution didn't start yet. It's right on the eve of the Industrial Revolution. So we didn't see all the things that the Industrial Revolution is going to make possible, or the, the changes that made possible. Yeah? Doesn't Charles Dickens touch on that a little bit in some of his work? Yeah, oh, he definitely does, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. Now they start making fun of Maltus. They make like um, cartoons, uh, you know, comics. They show people eating their offspring, like you know, someone with a really big mouth chopping, eating their baby's head because uh, there's uh, not going to be enough food for them, and, and they need something to eat. So they're they're, they're kind of laughing at. Him. Now, based on the information that he had available, it wasn't a ridiculous idea but he doesn't see all the things that the Industrial Revolution is going to make uh, possible. Now, to get you to appreciate just how much the Industrial Revolution really changed everything, and it's really going to influence every aspect of people's lives, from where they live, to what they do for a living, to the entertainment they have available, to the quality of their life, um, it's just going to change every aspect of it. Now, to get you to appreciate that, let's try to think of a revolution that occurred in your own lifetime. What, what would come to mind? Or could, could come to mind? The technology. Vastly different when uh, you know you were really little to what's available today. And doesn't that change every aspect of your life? Even the ability to like, you know, think of that you can take online courses. I don't want to say if you're too lazy to take regular, I don't want to say that. But particularly when teaching an online course. But um, uh, so where you can take classes to the way you learn to how you look for jobs, to how you meet a partner, um, to what you do for entertainment. They're all centered in one way or another around technology. Well, was all this technology available, um, you know, 15 years ago? No. So look how it changed everything. Now to get you to really appreciate that, Let's compare your life today uh, with uh, a generation ago, uh, your parents at the same time in life. Uh, so to do that, make it kind of make you something other than a college student, but re ready to start out in the world, we're going to push you ahead in college a little bit and have you all just graduated or about to graduate. Some of you would be, thank God, great. Others, oh no. Uh, so, but let, let's let's try that. 
Okay, so let's say you enjoyed your time here at uh, Del Val. Um, you made some friends, you learned a few interesting things, you um, gained some skills, uh, you owe a lot of money, you paid a lot of money. Okay. So, um, but now you're going out into the world. All right, so let's compare it with your parents a generation ago. Uh, all right, let's say, um, you know, you want to look for, you know, you enjoyed your time here, but, you know, face it, this area's a little boring, particularly for someone young. So you want to move somewhere exciting. Uh, Atlanta, Chicago, New Orleans, San Francisco, you know, where, wherever. How would you look for a job in Atlanta uh, today? Probably the same way you look for a job in Philadelphia or in Chalfont. Let your fingers do the walking. So technology. All right, how about your parents' generation ago? How, how, how could they have looked for an out-of-town job? Okay, so they would have had to uh, go there. Well, that, 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 that could work, but you know, you just graduated college. You have like all that money and time, because, well, time maybe, but do you have the money to go, you know, running all over the country, uh, flying places to look for jobs or driving to them? No, that, would, that wouldn't be too efficient. New good, newspapers, okay. Well, where, where could you get out of town newspapers? Could you just sort of go into the bookstore and ask whoever they have now there, uh, hey, do you have the Atlanta Journal Constitution? Are they going to have it? Now you're happy they have the inquirer there. So where could you have looked? Uh, the library. So a big regional library. Uh, like the Logan Square one in Philadelphia. I'm sure they have something here in uh, Bucks County equipment. Okay, and then you would look for the one ad, you look for something you're qualified for, have at least a little chance of getting. You know, they're asking for five years experience in aeronautics and you've never taken a physics course, you're probably not going to have much of a chance of getting that one, so you probably wouldn't waste your time. All right, but then you send them a cover letter and ask for an application, they mail it back, you fill it out, then if you're lucky, maybe you will get an interview. And um, then you would have to fly out there, and then they meet you for 15 minutes, and uh, then you fly back and kind of hope you hear from them that if they want a second interview, they probably would pay for you to fly out again. What about today, are they gonna do it that way? No. You'll immediately send it in, it'll tell you immediately whether it was received, and then uh, when they're probably done with the search, they'll say, thank you very much, applicant 47359, uh, you weren't chosen, good luck. If they're being nice or just ignore you if they're not. Full of warmth. Okay, but um, you are able to find a lot of places that you couldn't have found before because it's easy to do a uh, search by distance. So let's say uh, you were applying for a college job in um, Doylestown, but if you're not from this area, you probably never heard of Doylestown. So someone from another area would say, hey, uh, anywhere within 50 miles of Philadelphia, and bing, Doylestown shows up. So you got more people applying, but you're also able to apply for more people, so places, so it evens out. All right, but that's you know a job's only part of life. Uh, there is also um, music. Okay. Well, if you like the top 40 stuff, you will listen to 102 or years ago, and you know they will play the top 40 stuff till you get sick of it, then they move on to the next one. But what if you like more esoteric music, or something that's not as popular? Like I, I like classical music, particularly the music of the Baroque. You know, so me, Dr. Schmidt, and maybe ten other people in the country listen to it. No problem. They're, they're stations that play it 24 hours a day all around the world. But what about before? What would you have had to do? You'd have to either go to orchestra concerts, or you'd have to live in an area that had. Uh, 
uh, thriving um, classical music scene, so basically the big cities. Okay, but today, any kind of music you want, instantly uh, available. What about TV? All right, how many stations would you have had uh, years ago in this area? Do you think? This is pretty far out from the city, so I'm going to say five people, uh, five stations maybe. How about today? Thousands, right? So look how it's changed all aspects of life. All right, what about meeting that special person? Also, you know, you're starting your life, you probably want to share it with somebody. So either meeting someone for a memorable evening or for a lifetime or somewhere in between. Okay, what do you have available that they did not have available um, a generation ago? All the online dating apps. So it's changed every aspect of your life. So just as for this generation of the 1780s, the, tech, uh, the um, industrial revolution is going to change every aspect of their life. And as we're going to see, we'll see how many things have changed. So I just wanted to give you an idea of the perspective of it by relating it to something that's a little bit related to. Okay, see you on Thursday.